The book we're reading today is Schomburg, The Man Who Built a, a Library, written by Carol Boston Weatherford and illustrated by Eric Velasquez. In fifth grade, Arturo Schomburg was born with a sense of wonder. As a boy in Puerto Rico, he shadowed Tamba Creros, cigar workers. These men pooled money to pay a lector to read aloud in the library. Newspapers, novels, speeches, and politics. Arturo took in the scent of cured tobacco and the sound of the reader's voice. Thus, Arturo not only learned his ABCs, but also a love for the written word. So when his fifth grade teacher told him that Africans, sons and daughters had no history, no heroes worth noting. Did the twinkle leave Arturo's eyes? Did he slouch his shoulders, hang his head low, and look to the ground rather than to the horizon? No, his people must have contributed something over the centuries, history that teachers did not teach. Until they did, school children like Arturo would not learn of their own heritage. Ignorance, shackling them like chains. After that teacher dismissed his people's past, did the twinkle leave Arturo's eyes like a candle blown out in the dark? No, the twinkle never left. It grew into a spark. Genius. Where is our historians to give us our side, Artura asked, to teach our people our own history? Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Boren Quino, born in 1874, young Arturo Schomburg began a lifelong quest. Still a boy, he took on the mantle of historian because he had to know, he had to know the truth. In a history club, he noticed that the white youth seemed prouder of their heritage than the black members. Arturo read everything he could about his people, but he did not hurry. He let facts simmer. True scholarship requires time and calm effort, he figured. Nothing worthwhile is done in haste. After all, there were ages to traverse. Lost for hours in books, Arturo was transported by Benjamin Benneker's almanac to early America. Arturo studied all he could about this self-taught inventor astronomer and draftsman. He beamed as he read that Benneker accurately plotted a solar eclipse. Arturo could almost hear the tick-tock of Benneker's handcrafted wooden clock, the first built in the new world. Arturo imagined Benneker counting off minutes, racing time to redraft plans from memory for the streets of Washington, D.C., after French architect Pierre Lefant walked off and carted his papers with him to Europe. Benneker reproduced them in only two days. The nation's capital in two days, by heart. Tick tock, tick tock. Where were the monuments to this genius? El Emigrante, the Emigrant. When 17-year-old Arturo Schromberg immigrated to New York from Puerto Rico in 1891, he carried with him letters of introduction from cigar makers and from Jose Gonzalez Font, who owned a printing press in San Juan where Arturo had worked as a typographer. Arturo presented the letters to Flor Baerga, an amateur book collector and staunch opponent of Spanish colonial rule. 
Arturo perused Baerga's photos and clippings about New York's Puerto Rican community and soon found the local taboqueros. This time he lived among them, sharing their activism and their allegiance to Cuban and Puerto Rican independence from Spain in support of La Casa, the cause, Arturo joined political groups such as Las Dos Antillas, the two Antillas, and wrote letters to the editor of the newspaper, Patria, under the pen name of Guarionex. Newly arrived, Arturo sought to better himself, giving Spanish lessons while learning English in night school. Drawn to medicine and law, he pursued neither because, as the story goes, his official school records were lost in a fire. Not even a letter from a former teacher was sufficient proof of his formal education. Kindergarten was all that could be documented. So Arturo set aside dreams of a profession and toiled as a messenger and clerk at the law firm that was seeking to protect Johnson & Johnson's use of the Red Cross logo on its products. For that case, Arturo indexed and memorized thousands of pages of testimony, his recall of detail extraordinary. The book, Hunting Bug. I wanted to find out, said Arturo Schomburg, what my own racial group had contributed. He could not get his hands on enough books. His curiosity about Africana, insatiable. Arturo had what he called the book hunting disease. No one volume told the whole story and no library specialized in the subject. So he haunted rare bookstores, poring over fragile pamphlets with torn covers and leather books with paper mites between pages. Most of what he bought early on came cheap because white collectors considered it junk. Still, what he hunted was not easy to find. But Arturo knew what clues and markers to look for. Now and then he happened upon a prize. In Phyllis Wheatley, the first Africa-American and third American woman to have a book of poems published, Arturo found not only a devotion to God and country, but also a biography as remarkable as her verse. Captured at age seven in West Africa and named Phyllis after the slave ship on which she was cargo, she was sold to John Wheatley, but was sickly and thus never trained as his wife's servant. Poor in health, but rich in a rare brilliance, Phyllis quickly mastered English and read the Bible. She studied religion and the classics and spoke several languages fluently. But Phyllis was most phenomenal as a poet. If only Arturo could have been a gull, swooping and crooning above the waves as Phyllis crossed the Atlantic a second time, bound for London to promote her book. Poems on various subjects, religious and moral. In 1773, if only that same year, Arturo could have witnessed that stroke of the pin, granting Phyllis her freedom. If only Arturo could have looked over her shoulder, seen her pinning that praise poem to George Washington during the revolution. Although she offered subscriptions for a second book, her final manuscript was never published or found. If only, thought Arturo, I could find that. Frederick Douglass. As Arturo fanned the pages of Frederick Douglass' narrative, it was as if a breeze carried him to the riverfront plantation where sailboats first defined freedom for young Frederick. 
like Arturo. Frederick loved the written word. He even broke the law against slaves, learning to read. As Frederick escaped bondage, Arturo followed his trail from Maryland all the way to Massachusetts. And when Douglas roared against slavery, his speeches, agitate, 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 awoke Arturo to the power of the pen. With that aim, Douglas had rallied the abolitionist cause, winning pledges of support and thunderous applause. Arturo scanned Douglas's anti-slavery newspaper, The North Star. The publication's motto rang true, right is of no sex, truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and all men are brethren. 10,000 volumes could not better define democracy. A printer's helper as a teen, Arturo imagined Douglas setting metal type and cranking the letterpress. A tall man with deep set eyes and a long woolly mane, Douglas went on to become the US minister to Haiti. In his later years, he bought Cedar Hill, an estate in Washington's Anacostia section, where he was deemed a sage. Frederick's name, thought Arturo, in every archive should reside. The words that Douglas wrote would keep his memory alive. Revolutionaries. As Schomburg's search went on, he bought not only books, but also art, letters, prints, and rare African cameos. His was a war to combat ignorance and shatter lies. He needed an arsenal for that. From the past, Arturo enlisted an army of exemplars. His boyhood hero was Toussaint Louverture, leader of the revolt that liberated slaves in Haiti. Later, Arturo purchased military orders signed by Louverture, himself a freed slave with property and money. He risked all to join a slave revolt. Just a generation after American independence, Louverture led a revolution that lasted 12 years and cost thousands of lives. His troops fought off first the French, then the British, and finally the Spanish before victory was won and a black republic born, Haiti. For colonies and countries founded on slavery, the Haitian Revolution was a hurricane. Whispers of Louverture's name made slaveholders shudder. Contrary to popular belief, slaves did rise up, and not just in the glorious liberation of Haiti, Arturo eventually traced the roots of rebellion to early America. He read the radical pamphlet that David Walker, a free black merchant published in 1829, an appeal to the colored citizens of the world, calling for slaves to rise up, a fiery tract that was banned in its day. Arturo studied the 1839 mutiny on the slave ship Amistad and the court case that followed. Some states soon outlawed anti-slavery literature and forbade blacks from learning to read. What did slaveholders fear? In South Carolina and Virginia, Denmark Bessie and Gabriel Prosser planned uprisings. And in Virginia, Nat Turner carried out his vision. His 1831 insurrection brought together 70 blacks, slave and free, and left 57 whites dead. Arturo breathed in his hero's brave words. In his way, Schomburg was a revolutionary too.
three Elizabeths. Artur first married in 1895, the same year he adopted the English version of his name, Arthur. Elizabeth Hatcher of Staunton, Virginia was his bride. She died young, leaving her husband to raise two sons, Maximo Gomez and Kingsley Guarionex. A third, Arturo Alfonso Jr. died in infancy. His second wife was Elizabeth Morrow Taylor, also from Virginia. From their union came two more children, Reginald Stanfield and Nathaniel Jose. Both boys lived in Virginia with their half-brothers and the mother's mother. It was common then for parents who worked in cities to send their children off to be raised by kin. On visits to the South, Arturo bristled at the color line. When the second Elizabeth passed on, he married another, Elizabeth Green. They were blessed with three children, Fernando, Dolores Marie, and Placido Carlos. Despite their Spanish names, Chambord wouldn't let his offspring learn his native tongue. They were Americans. Whitewash. In his quest for black glory, Arturo Schomburg navigated a maze of misinformation that stripped Africans' humanity and branded them as less than to justify slavery. The system was based on skin color superiority and inferiority and was necessary, argued aristocrats, to build fortunes and empires. Arturo suspected a conspiracy of fraud that aimed to erase all African history but bondage. Arturo saw that the historical record was colorblind only when that best served greedy motives. So when genius was black, the skin color was left out. But Schomburg chased the truth and turned up icons whose African heritage had been whitewashed. Arturo found African roots in the family tree of artists, ornithologists, and naturalist John James Audubon. His masterpiece was the book Birds of America, with watercolors, pastel crayons, charcoal, and pencils. He depicted North American birds in stunning, lifelike poses. Yet for all Audubon's fame, it was rare mention that he was born to a French plantation owner and a Creole chambermaid. As a boy, Arturo read The Three Musketeers. I used to lose myself in that book, he later wrote, and think I was fighting with Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. He memorized their motto, all for one and one for all, but he had no inkling that the author, Frenchman Alexander Dumas, was descended from slaves. Why had Arturo not learned that as a child? Arturo discovered that Russia had its black star too. The great poet Alexander Pushkin, father of that country's modern literature, his first work published when he was just 15. His great grandfather was Abram Ganabal, who was kidnapped as a child in Central Africa, served in the court of Peter the Great, and rose to become a general and an aristocrat himself. No wonder Pushkin was famed for fighting duels. Even German composer Ludwig van Beethoven had ties to Africa. He was often described as dark, a mulatto, or moor. His mother was said to be a moor North African. Gifted beyond belief, Beethoven still composed after he lost his hearing. How could this maestro's African heritage have been muted? How could Arturo ever behold Beethoven's Fifth Symphony without hearing Africa's drumming? Seafaring. 
Arturo Schomburg was becoming quite a collector. He nabbed two volumes by Paul Cuffey, an early American whaler, shipbuilder, and maritime trader whose fleet sailed the U.S. Atlantic coast to the Caribbean and to Europe. On ships he'd built, Cuffey and his crew whaled in the waters of the Atlantic. This was dirty and dangerous work, but necessary. First harpoons flew and later blubber was rendered into whale oil for lamps to light growing cities. Paul Coffey was one of the richest black men in early America. He could afford to speak his mind. Coffey wrote a petition that free blacks should be able to vote since they paid taxes. And he was the first to float the back to Africa idea. He could see free blacks and free slaves settling in Sierra Leone someday. Cuffey sailed there, set foot on West African soil to judge if his new society might root. At the White House, he reported that his dream to send one vessel to Africa each year held a promise. In Cuffey, Arturo found a forerunner to Marcus Garvey, the Harlem Renaissance leader who preached Black pride, self-help, and like Cuffey a century earlier, a return to Africa. In the 1920s, Arturo supported Garvey, his newspaper Negro World and his Black Star steamship line. As the Garveyites paraded down Harlem's 125th Street in plumed hats and tasseled brass buttoned uniforms, did Paul Cuffey's voyages cross Arturo's mind? Bloodhound. Though a mailroom clerk at a bank by day, Arturo rubbed shoulders with Alan Locke, dubbed the father of the Harlem Renaissance. And he corresponded with Booker T. Washington, founder of Tuskegee Institute, and W.E.B. Du Bois, an Atlanta University professor and the first African-American to earn a doctorate from Harvard. The two disagreed about whether to push for social or economic progress, but they agreed that black history could be a bridge. Arturo's acquaintances were a who's who of the Harlem Renaissance. He was invited to the first meeting of an informal guild of young black writers. Poets, Count T. Cullen and Langston Hughes were members. So was novelist and poet Jesse Redmond Fawcett, an editor of the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, and of the African American children's magazine, The Brownies Book. These writers joined Arna Bonteps, George Douglas Johnson, and artist Aaron Douglas. And asking Arturo to hunt for historic references that could water the seeds of creative scholarly endeavors. His collection, Fertile Soil for Growing Black Pride, when it came to digging up rare finds and obscure facts, Arturo had what poet Claude McKay called a bloodhound's nose. Arturo loaned not only books to students, artists, and writers, he also lent interpretations, insights, and sometimes cash. With book lists full of texts that Schomburg found, his friends mined blackness and broke new ground. Home. Busy, always busy, said Fernando of his father, Arturo Schomburg. He was gone, traveling on lecture tours or collecting missions for what seemed like eight months each year. And when he was home in Brooklyn, he was out most evenings for club and lodge meetings. His visiting children lived among the countless books in his collection. His only daughter, Dolores, greeted artists and scholars who came by to view his growing library. Arturo's wife, Elizabeth, fought to carve out living space for the family, but that was a losing battle. Her efforts to clean his desk, also in vain. When she cleared the clutter to dust, 
He complained that important references were misplaced. She finally left well enough alone. Writer and researcher, Arturo Schomburg aimed to prove African's place in world history. In Harlem, he joined the Men's Sunday Club, which grew into the Negro Society for historical research. The society sponsored lectures and galas, and in its first year amassed more than 300 books and manuscripts. Arturo stored that collection at his home alongside his own. He was also president of the American Negro Academy and grand secretary of the all black Prince Hall Grand Masonic Lodge. And he served on the committee to start a Negro division at the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. Civic minded, but no social climber, he skipped the famed parties of the Roaring Twenties Jazz Age. Arturo preferred leafing through history to dancing the Lindy Hop. With a busy schedule of lectures and meetings, it's a wonder he had time for research or writing. Arturo's articles, essays, and letters to the editor shared what he had learned. Facts kept in darkness far too long. He profiled 18th century composer Chevalier de Saint George, a French knight known as the Black Mozart, St. George was a song to Artura's heart. He also wrote of gladiators, military leaders, and majesty. One article tells of a huge pearl found by an African slave on an island in the Gulf of Panama. The jewel adorned Spanish queens until Napoleon's brother took it to France. Sold to a British duke, the pearl was lost in Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle, but was recovered each time. The gems fabled past earned it this name, the Peregrina, the Wanderer. Arturo's research pulled him along the triangular trade route, just as surely as wind currents and greed carried supplies from Europe to Africa to barter for slaves and took captive Africans to American colonies to grow sugar cane that would be distilled into rum to be sold in Europe. Through the pages of history, Arturo toured the diaspora. His sense of Africana transcended national boundaries. Heritage for him was braided from many threads. Arturo's most important article was for survey graphic, the Negro digs up his past, ran in a special issue, Harlem, Mecca of the New Negro. On the contents page, Arturo is listed among other contributors, scholars and creative geniuses. Schomburg's words give voice to the ancestors. Their pigment flowed through his pen. Sold. Rumor has it that Schomburg's wife put her foot down. Either his books or their family must go. Only a threat like that could make him part with his prizes. There were bookshelves filled with books all over the house. A family member said even in the bathroom, the books were carefully cataloged, inventoried in Arturo's head and arranged by size and color of binding. But Arturo's library had outgrown private hands. He had turned down a very handsome offer because the collection deserved a wider audience. Arturo had already lent items to libraries and staged exhibitions for schools and community groups. He approached the New York Public Library, but it lacked funds to purchase his vast holdings. So the Carnegie Corporation bought the entire lot for $10,000 and in 1926 donated it to the library. If Harlem was the heart of African-American culture, the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library was the mind. If the library were a university, 
its alumni would include the Harlem Renaissance figures who lost themselves amid its stacks and wrote in quiet room downstairs. Schomburg's collection, which one newspaper called Matchless, was housed on the third floor and would become the cornerstone of the vision of Negro history, literature, and prints. It included more than 5,000 books, several thousand pamphlets, plus priceless prints and papers, among them an autographed first edition of poems by Phyllis Wheatley, the brilliant slave girl. There were handwritten poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, letters of heroic General Toussaint Louverture, speeches of slave turned statesman Frederick Douglass, Benjamin Banneker's early American almanac, and a 1573 book of poems by Spaniard Juan Latino, perhaps the first printed book by a Black person. This university, Artero Schomburg studied the past, but he did not dwell in it, quite the opposite. His mission looked to the future. I'm proud, said Schomburg, to be able to do something that may mean inspiration for the youth of my race. After a decade of headaches and nosebleeds, Arturo retired in 1929 from his job at Bankers Trust, but he did not rest. He spent more time writing and researching and tending the collection at the 135th Street Library. On the strength of his reputation as a bibliophile, Arturo was invited to Nashville in 1931 to found Fisk University's library's Negro collection. By 1932, he had added 4,000 volumes to the library's holdings. Lincoln's Bible was the centerpiece. When Arturo first held it, he thought of the free blacks from Baltimore who had presented the hefty book to the president during the Civil War. That Bible was a priceless treasure, but Arturo did not want black heritage behind the glass. He wanted his research to reach students, so he told professors what to teach include the practical history of the Negro race from the dawn of civilization to the present time. Then young blacks would hold their heads high and view themselves as anyone's equal. Doctor, after a year at Fisk University in Tennessee, Arturo Schomburg returned to New York. At the Public Library's 135th Street branch, his treasures were now the core of the Division of Negro History, Literature, and Prints. Arturo became the guardian of his collection. His peculiar method of shelving books arranged them by size and color like a bouquet. In fact, he fired a new librarian for using the standard Dewey Decimal System. The historical figures he unearthed still spoke to him, tell our stories and proclaim our glories. From his perch on the library's third floor, Arturo guided researchers, spoke at afternoon teas, and used his own funds to enlarge the collection. Among his gifts, African Venus and Said Abdullah, classic bronzes by French sculptor Charles Henry Joseph Cordier, bought in Paris, both pieces had shown in the Louvre in 1860s. At $50, the stunning pair were a steal. Arturo was not wealthy, but he used the money from the sale of his collection to build on it. When an item was over his budget, he was not ashamed to appeal to friends for funds. He asked a fellow book collector to donate a bronze and marble, marble bust of Shakespearean character Othello, a Moorish general, to put on display. Arturo organized exhibitions about Russian literary giant Alexander Pushkin and Black Shakespearean actor Ira Aldridge. Our Pioneers, Arturo's weekly column for the Amsterdam News, 
was read all over Harlem. The library staff called Arturo Dr. Schomburg. The homegrown historian had earned that honor. Art. In etchings, prints, paintings, and sculpture, Arturo Schomburg saw not just art, but also an opportunity to offer visible proof of the talent and accomplishments of African descendants. The eye, he supposed, would refute the lie. Arturo was drawn to work showing black subjects, regardless of the artist's skin color, and to works created by black artists, regardless of subject matter. Whether he was collecting the work of Harlem Renaissance painters, such as Aaron Douglas and Lois Melu Jones, sculptures like Charles Henry Joseph Cordier, or Spanish Baroque artists like Sebastian Gomez and Juan de Pareja, Arturo embraced and pursued art with the same passion and persistence that he did book buying. Art, he thought, might reach those who would never read a book. Spain. Arturo Schomburg had gained respect from Harlan's intellects, but he had yet to trace his own roots. African, Spanish, and Taino Indian from the Caribbean to Europe and Africa. So he voyaged across the Atlantic, not to collect, but to connect the dots. I depart now, he said, on a mission of love to recapture my lost heritage. He mined libraries, museums, and rare bookstores for Spain's link in the chain of slavery. He beheld masterworks painted by African hands and marveled at palaces and mosques built by the Arab African Muslims who ruled Spain for 800 years. Well, these scenes and canvases are true, filed in his mind's eye. During Spain, France, Germany, and England did not produce answers to all his questions but Arturo had more than enough facts to take home. This was Schomburg's only trip to Europe and the farthest he would ever travel. No distance was too great to set history straight. The islands. Arturo Alfonso Schomburg may have felt kinship with African-Americans and their cause of equality and even worked to build pride among them. He may have adopted the anglicized version of his name, Arthur, and insisted that his children speak only English and not Spanish, his own mother tongue. But he never lost his love for the Caribbean or his longing for Puerto Rico, the island of his birth. His research took him back to the Caribbean and to Latin America, Haiti and Dominican Republic, Panama and Cuba. Arturo was a bridge between great minds in Havana and Harlan. In 1932, he met Cuban poet Nicholas Julian and with Club Antinas, a group of writers, artists, and scholars who celebrated Cubans' rich and cultural heritage. Most of Arturo's publications focused on the Caribbean and Spain. His first, an article on the Haitian Revolution and Independence, at the 135th Street Library in Harlem. Arturo organized exhibitions of Cuban folklore and literature, but despite his yearnings, he never visited Puerto Rico after 1909. Epitaph, 1938. If this proverb, a book is like a garden carried in a pocket is true, then Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, the historian and book collector, had a green thumb and a harvest of pride. There was no field of human endeavor that he did not till with his determined hand, that he did not sow with seeds of curiosity, where he did not weed out lies and half-truths, or that he did not water with a growing sense of African awareness and heritage 
If a book is a garden carried in a pocket, then Schomburg yielded a bumper crop, blanketed Mount Kilimanjaro with African violets. Mm -hmm.